everybody. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm going to be doing a demo today on coil building. Um, coil, it's actually, I'm going to show two different techniques, coil building and coil slab building. So <coughs> coil building, I apologize for the cough. I'm being over laryngitis right now. Um, coil building is often seen as a technique which is um, a little bit lower skill rather than um, something which more advanced students would do. It is often used as a, a gateway for younger students for um, kids classes. And I would actually argue that uh, both pinch pots and coil building are more of a <coughs> an advanced technique. Uh, they take a lot of pardon me. They take a lot of patience. They take a lot of dexterity, a lot of um, a lot of skill to actually get what you want and um, to manipulate the material material in an effective way. Uh, at the top of the food chain of coil builders, I would have to say is. Uh, Magdalene Odundu, who is an African um, artist, and um, she has work in the Smithsonian. Um, it's phenomenal. Uh, if you are ever wondering how far you can go with coil building, she is a fantastic example. But um, coil is just a construction technique, and with any of the techniques that I'm going to be covering, what you make out of it is entirely up to you. It's not a limitation of the technique as much as it might be a limitation of um, your imagination or uh, just kind of how much time you want to put into the process of learning it and of um, refining what you're making. Um, first off here, I've got um, just some clay raw from the bag. And <coughs> I'm fine with using fresh clay. Um, that's been pugged for doing coil building. Um, when I took the piece, I, I started squeezing out the coil. This is essentially wedging. Uh, when you squeeze it like this to get the coil started, uh, you're wedging the clay. And once I start rolling it, I'm going to be compressing the clay. So coils are actually fairly well compressed, um, all things considered. And I'm going to use a bed sheet here on my canvas board to make it so that I have less of a canvas texture on my coils when they're done. This is also helpful if you wanted to work on a slightly damper surface. I can spray this down, make this fabric a little bit more damp so that the coils don't crack because uh, the cloth isn't absorbing water from them. Or I can do it because I need a dry surface. And as this gets dampened from me working on it, I can just get a fresh sheet, start over, have a nice dry surface again. So having bed sheets like this gives you kind of an infinite amount of surface areas that you can work on. Uh, to roll my slab out, I'm spreading my fingers out as wide as I can, and I'm basically doing a W motion. So just like making the letter W and just feeling for flats in the coil as I'm rolling. Um, and that's pretty much it. it. It takes a bit, actually, to get good at rolling an even coil. Um, you, would, you would think, again, you know, this should be super easy, like anyone can do it. But it, it, it takes some time. And then rolling a second coil that looks just like this coil, that's the same thickness, um, that can be really tough. There's another way of rolling them, or at least starting them, that you can try, which uh, my studio mate in college used to do. And he would do this with very large pieces of clay. Um, but you can take a, a lump of clay, a tapered lump, basically like what you would use for doing fold handles. And you can gradually roll the coil out from the lump, kind of in midair. And uh, he was pretty impressive. He could sit and he would just like roll these things onto the floor and he would make a little pile of coils right into a plastic bag. <laughs> he could do like 10 pound lumps of clay at once. It was, it was pretty good. Um, all his work was coil built. So he, he had a lot of practice. But you can see that got me pretty close, just like squeezing the clay did. And then as I'm stretching it out a little bit further, I can make my fingers into a W. If you find that you need a little bit more moisture than you have, just use a spray bottle. 
and it just sprays a little bit, and that'll help keep the coil from cracking. There we go. And usually to kind of feel if they're close, I mean, I can tell these, these actually aren't exactly the same. Um, I started with more clay for the second one, so it needs to be stretched out further. But to feel if they're close, you can actually roll them together, and you'll feel which one is a little bit bigger than the other one. It'll give you a sense of where you need to adjust. If I get a flat area in the coil, um, like, like this part right here, that's kind of flat, just put it up on its end, kind of square it off, and then keep rolling. And it's the small, quick, repetitive movement that gives you even coils. You don't want to apply a lot of pressure and kind of work it hard in order to get it to um, roll out. All right. Um, I'm going to get some water for the next step. Be right back. Okay, I've got a bowl of water here, and I have a scoring tool. Um, this is called a Valentine scoring tool. It's actually made out of guitar strings, um, the core of a wound guitar string. And um, I'll do a video on this at some point. Developed by a ceramic artist at Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in the 70s. Fantastic tool. Best scoring tool you'll ever use. It works both as a scoring tool and as a brush, so it can hold a little bit of water. And what I'm going to want to do is to either roll out a slab and start my coils on the slab, or start making a base um, with the coils themselves, which is what I'm going to do in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and score one edge of my coil. And then using the same tool, I can dip and add a little bit of water. When you're putting pieces together, you want those joining surfaces to be mushy, to actually be nice and soft. If they're not, they're not going to fuse and become one piece of clay. All right, now I'm also then going to turn this so that the scored side is away from me. And then score the other side, because I'm going to be doing this as like a spiral. So I need the two scored surfaces to come in contact with each other and stick together real well for me. The clay I'm using here is Little Loafers, which is a clay from, from high water clay in North Carolina. Uh, it's a porcelainous clay, so it's porcelain-like, but not quite as smooth and, and fine as porcelain. Uh, it works good for a lot of different things. Works great for this. All right, let me actually flip this so you can see the, the rolling process. So I've got, it's nice and sticky. And I've got the two parts coming into contact with each other. So I want a scored, sticky surface hitting a scored, sticky surface. And if it dries out while you're, while you're working, and this guy's actually twisting a little bit, just score it again. If you feel that it's, it's going dry, don't keep going. It is not going to end well. Coil pots have a lot of seams. It's all seams. <laughs> and you can squish them together, you can smooth them, you can do other things, but it's a lot of seams, no matter what you're doing. So you, you need to be careful with that many contact points. And then when I'm done, I'm actually going to take and kind of wiggle this, sort of push a little bit, not enough to squish the coil. But I want to wiggle it and make sure that's a nice solid connection. Like I said, there's there's a lot of there's a whole lot of seams here. And I just want to make sure those are gonna be okay. Now depending on kind of like what my goal is for this, um let's go ahead and make just like kind of a small cylinder. Uh we'll do something fairly simple. Uh this coil building takes some time, so I don't wanna keep you here all day. Um so <clears throat> I'm going to then want to kind of taper this off a little bit, and then I'm going to go vertical. Um, I can either pinch this down so it's tapered, or I could add in another little short piece. And I can also squeeze parts of it out to make it kind of a little more rounded. Um, little bits here that are kind of cracked, 
Might use a little bit of water and compress those closed again. Not a lot. Water is not your friend, actually, when you're doing this kind of thing. We're taking something which is a semi-solid, and we're wanting to get it to be drying kind of in the most efficient way possible. So constantly adding water back into the mix is going to slow that down for us. Um, and clay is going to shrink. This one's going to shrink about 11% from uh, wet to finely fired. And the more I keep changing different parts of it as far as their moisture content, the more issues I might run into with bits of it shrinking more <coughs> quickly than other bits. Um, and also, kind of while, while we're on that, that topic, one of the best things you can do with coil pots when you're done with them is to wrap them up um, and just leave them overnight because a lot of the issues that you're potentially going to have are alleviated through just a little bit of time. Clay will naturally even itself out as far as moisture content over time. The moisture will wick from a, a wetter part of the clay to a drier part of the clay. It will become homogeneous as far as its moisture, all on its own, just with time. So if you can wrap this up overnight, you know, 12 hours, the next day, any of the spots that were more damp because of me putting them together will have evened out, and they'll have done it slowly so that the shrinkage shouldn't warp it or crack things or cause seams to open. That's what you would want to avoid. All right, I just scored this coil. And I already have scored this. I want to check and make sure that's still damp. I don't really want this ending point to line up with the other ending point, so I'm just going to offset that a little bit. Like I said, I'm basically just going to make this into a little cylinder. All right, when I get to this point here, I'm going to taper that coil down a little. And the top of this needs to be scored, just like the first layer was on the base. Make sure you're lining up your scoring. And I'm going to score this part here. So as I go, I score. Instead of trying to score too much of it all at once. Um, I, and I'm not going to keep checking this one. I'm just going to make sure that the scoring for the piece it's connecting to is nice and, and damp. I know this is drying out, but I can make sure I have a good connection so long as the piece I'm adding it to is made perfect. Right. Get that scored. There we go. And you'll see, I, I score like I mean it. You want, you want to really score this. Uh, let me show you a trick for joining up two coils if you don't want to taper them each time. What you can do is you can line them up uh, with each other like this, and then just take a fettling knife and cut through both of them at the same time. And then that will give you a nice angled cut, and then you can score and put that cut together. Dip into my tea cup. Done that before. Be the first clay I've eaten. All right. Get this scored. Actually, ingesting clay is probably one of the least harmful things that you can do with it. <laughs> clay is mostly dangerous if you're inhaling it. Um, so if you're going to avoid anything, avoid breathing the dust. A lot of studios will say that you shouldn't have open containers in the studio. Um, usually that actually has less to do with clay dust than it does alumina dust or glaze dust. Uh, all these ceramic materials go airborne really easily. And alumina is a material that's used in kiln wash and um, on kiln, or so for kiln shelves, wadding for salt kilns. It's... Um, a material that has been shown to cause sterility in men when ingested. So uh, we usually try and protect people from that one. And it's kind of always in the dust. Right. Let's cut this. 
And right now you're thinking, yeah, it's good that he kept this mercifully small. I was starting to rotate it, so I just rotate that back so that that scoring line is meeting up. All right. My last little bit here. And there we go. And so I would go in and just like I did for the base here, I'm going to want to kind of push a little bit and wiggle and make sure that my connection between these coils, between each row of coils, is nice and stable. I can kind of work my way out. I can also straighten it a little bit as I go. As always make it a little bit better. All right. Pretty good. Okay, so I kept this very fairly thick, pretty simple. The the ideas it doesn't really matter all that much um, how big I'm going. It's just the same thing. You just do it over more time. Now, if I'd made this with thinner coils and I wanted to go much taller, what I would do is do a, a couple of inches of it, let that start to get leather hard, and then start adding the rest on top. <coughs> If I was building up like that, I would also be keeping the bottom as it's stiffening wrapped up in plastic. So I want to keep this stiff enough that it can support more material on top, but I also don't want it to dry out so much that there's a huge shrinkage difference between the top and the bottom before it has a chance to even out. Uh, so here's a piece that was done with um, smaller coils, and um, I kind of flattened them a little bit as I went. Uh, but so this one, as I got to about here, I let it get uh, leather hard. Then I added the next layer. Then I let that get leather hard. Then I put this bottom part in a bag. And as I worked my way up, I was just making sure that it was supporting itself. But when I'm done, it should all be able to be the same amount of moisture content. And I want to keep it wrapped up overnight so that it evens out and I'm not going to have a whole bunch of weird shrinkage or warping problems with it. Um, and you know, this is going to be a like a tumbler mug. Um, I didn't want to put a handle on it. I really like this this texture that I've got going from the coils. So to accentuate that, I kind of did some indents in the surface. Once this shrinks down, it'll kind of be a perfect fit for my hand, and it'll be a really nice tactile piece to to hold on to. Okay. Now all those seams that we've got going, there's a couple of solutions to them if you want to use them. Um, one of the more common solutions is that you actually blend this all together. Um, you can just take a tool and just either blend the inside and not the outside or both, um, however you want to do it. You could partially make this into a pinch pot. Um, so you can start by forming with coils and then you can also pinch those coils as you go. And then they, the wall would become a little thinner and it would uh, also get a little bit taller with the same amount of material. I can do that for this top two courses of coils. You can kind of see a little bit what that starts to look like. Um, so coil building and say like pinch pots are really techniques for often just getting you started and then you're going to use other forms and other techniques and things with them down the road. So similar to when you when you throw in a potter's wheel, you can only get so much out of it. I mean, it's one, it, it's going to be round. Um, and anything else you want to do with it, you've got to do off the wheel. You've got to do as an additional process. So I wouldn't be really shy about, you know, starting it with coil, doing something else with it, um, kind of like mixing it up a bit as far as how you want to change it. Uh, let me grab a wooden tool here. and. So a lot of times people don't quite understand why our tools are made out of different materials. Um, it's not necessarily arbitrary. The different materials are better for doing different things with the clay. And one of those things is if I want to, to blend or to smear this clay, I don't want a smooth, slick tool like a metal tool, uh, like a metal rib or something um, like this. 
Um, I actually want something that is dry and has a little bit of texture to it, similar to how my fingers are. And as far as like, I have texture to my skin um, because that dry wood is going to be better at grabbing the clay and kind of smearing it and blending it together than it's going to be if it's something that's shiny or really, really hyper smooth, like plastic or metal. Um, and the reason I want that kind of gripping is that that's what's allowing me to have some control and to not have to use too much force. If it's too smooth, then I'm going to have issues with having to push really hard. And this clay is fairly soft at this point. So I'm, I'm walking a, a bit of a, a tight rope. I want the clay to still be soft enough that I can blend this together and maybe get more of a smoother inside. That's my goal for this particular pot. Um, but because it's softer like this, it, it is going to be easier for me to deform the clay. And I don't really want to push or ruin all of the texture and the work that I've got on the outside. I want to keep that look. So I'm doing a combination of using a wooden tool and also trying to kind of dig into the clay a little bit with as much of an edge of that tool as possible. So the smaller the amount of surface area that you use to engage the clay, the more force you can apply in that same amount of space. So if I want to apply very little force, I use the flat. As I want to increase the force, I move more and more to an edge. The edge allows me to put a lot of force on the clay, but without pushing into the clay as much as I might have to otherwise. You can experiment with it and see how that feels, but there's quite a difference. And in order to blend this, I'm kind of going in one direction against the seam and then back again in the other direction. I'm blending up and down, uh, which is going to be difficult to see, but um, I just kind of start off by blending up. And then come back and just hit the same spot, blending down. I'm trying to cradle it a little bit with my hand so that I can feel if I'm deforming those outside ridges. I want those to kind of remain intact. <coughs> Excuse me. That's why I have my tea here. All right. So. So. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this whole thing because that's gonna be painful. And I'm not fancy enough to do time lapse yet. So we're just gonna do part of this. And you'll get the idea. Um, let's rotate this a little bit for you. And I would go and I would do this in stages. So when you're trying to refine something in clay, you need to embrace how the clay changes over the time that it dries. There are things that I can do when the clay is wet, when it's soft, that I can't do later. But there are things that are more appropriate to do after it's stiffened up. I need to wait. Um, and I can get this kind of all nice and worked together as far as the seams. And now's a really good time to do that. But if I want this to get cleaner, I need to wait. So I need to get it blended. And then I need to walk away. It's going to be really hard because often, especially as students who are just starting out, you, you kind of like, this is my pot. Like, this is the thing I'm working on and I'm going to work on it, damn it, until it's done. And that's kind of your mindset. So you just overwork it and you don't give it any time or any space. Um, if you find yourself doing that, being like, oh, okay, is it dry yet? Is it dry yet? Is it dry yet? Make more work. Uh, basically, that's my that was my defense in college. I would just sit and and pick this thing to death until it was destroyed, or I could make ten of them. <laughs> and by the time I finished forming the tenth one, the first one was early leather hard, and I could start finishing it. And so numbers gave me like a an illusion of patience that was something that I I still don't possess. Um, why I'm in ceramics, but um, instant gratification. Um, so I would do one pass at this point, then wait until this is early leather hard. And then I would come back and I would probably want to approach it more with some kind of a scraping tool and take some of these high points off. Or I would approach it with um, 
uh, a metal tool, maybe like the edge of a spoon, like a small spoon, and and compress and scrape in order to get this to be a little bit smoother. And then I would let it get to late leather hard or just before the edge is getting kind of dusty looking. And then I'd go into it again and I'd do some scraping. If this is porcelain or even little loafers like this, after it's dry, I can take it outside. I can put on a dust mask um, and potentially make sure I've got clothes on uh, that I can wash when I'm done or a leaf blower nearby because I'm going to get covered in dust. And I could also sand the inside to make it perfectly smooth. Um, porcelain allows you to do things like that. The only problem with dry sanding your work is that it's very dangerous. And if you're going to do it, you need to do it in a place where the dust doesn't matter. You need to be ready to take a shower when you're all done because it's going to be in your hair. Or you got to cover your hair. you got to put on clothing that you can then wash when you're all done. Be really cognizant of the dust as being a hazard. What I usually do is I dry sand and then I grab my leaf blower and I kind of blow myself off with the leaf blower, which gets 90% of it. Then I take my, my clothes and they go into the laundry right away and I take a shower. Um, so that, that keeps everyone in my house safe as well. When clay dust goes airborne, it stays airborne for up to 18 hours. Uh, and that's if in a still room. So... I bring a bunch of dust in my house and I'm like, puff, 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 and the dust is going everywhere. When my son comes home from school three, four hours later, it, it's, it's in the air. Um, we walk through the house, so it stays airborne. There's not actually an 18 hour period where the air is not moving in my house. I either have myself or a cat or a child or somebody moving through here or a ceiling fan. The dust just is always in the air until you've breathed it all in and it's all stuck in your lungs. So just be really aware of the dust if you're gonna use a technique like that. Um, I mentioned coil slab, but I think this demo's um, a good length at this point. So I'm gonna do um, coil slab as a separate video. Uh, I'm trying to keep this a little bit shorter. Brevity is also not one of my, my strong suits. Um, so thank you for joining me. And um, it's just another forming technique. It does not need to be crude. It does not need to be rough. Um, if I took this piece, I'm just going to keep wrapping up with this good habit. I could take this and I could use a surform on the outside and I could make that perfectly smooth if I'd wanted to. I would have just pushed all of these little pieces together when it was at this stage, like I'm doing on the inside of this one. I would have waited for it to get more to leather hard, scraped it, and then used a metal rib to take off the marks from the surform. And then I could have used a stiff rubber rib and smoothed that down. I'll do, again, a separate video on um, refining surfaces because it's a really good thing to kind of have under your belt. It'll really help uh, make your work look that much better. You really just need to spend more time on most of it probably to get the results you're, you're really looking for. Uh, anyhow, okay, well, thanks for joining me. And um, see you again soon. Take care.